In the case of elections, this is extremely valuable. Because as elections are happening, if you can timestamp all of that data as it's coming in and as it's created, you've essentially created forensic information using Bitcoin that can allow people to determine what the probabilities are that a certain document is real or fake. You effectively reduce 99% of the attack surface of an election to a very, very small moment in time the beginning. Carlino, it's uh, good to see you back here in Ozante. Siempre un gusto, Mike. <laughs> it's, uh, I think, last... When was the last time you were here? Was that a year ago? Ah, uh, Sonte. Sonte, yeah, probably a year ago. No, more, actually. I, I just remember you had this, like, cryptic conversation with me that, you know, you were starting this new thing and you were going to have to go off the radar for a while. <laughs> And now we're here to talk about that cryptic thing that you were uh, involved with. Popping back up? Yeah. Right. Thank you. So Bitcoin protecting elections. I came for democracy, but I stayed for Bitcoin. <laughs> so I'm uh, pretty excited to delve into this. Uh, it's going to probably be way too technical for me. So you're going to talk to me like I'm a kindergartner, like my kids talk to me. <laughs> But uh, excited to, to dive into this and see, I know this is something that you've been super passionate about from the very beginning. I think even the first time you guys came before the Bitcoin law was passed here and you guys came to visit us here, you were talking about this project. And it's so, how I found out about your work in December 2020 uh, when we were uh, part of the LaBitConf uh, Blockchain for Humanity uh, Awards. And so, yeah, thanks to following this passion, this this uh, itch that I have to scratch, I ended up finding out about what you've been building here. And so I, it's what led me to come in April 2021 and, and meet with you before it all Yeah, you guys happened. just randomly showed up. <laughs> that was pretty funny. Um, and that was before, you know, now, of course, people are coming here all the time. But at that time, you know, we hadn't had that many visitors. So it was... You guys were the first kind of Central Americans that had come. There had been people from the U.S., but it was it was for me it was kind of like wow we got people traveling from Guatemala now to come see what's happening here. So that was really exciting. Um, but yeah, love to hear your Bitcoin story, sure. um, how you were first exposed to it, and how you made this connection with how it could protect elections. Well, the connection to the elections uh, came a little later, but uh, the short version of how I came to Bitcoin is uh, Guatemala has a university that is Austrian economics inspired called Universidad Francisco Marroquín. And the dean or the, the head of the university was a, it's a libertarian Austrian economics school. So they were part of that first wave of people that uh, through the libertarian circles found out about Bitcoin. I, I, I don't want to get you off a roll, but I, I, you're bringing up something that I, I am curious about on yeah, a personal sure. level. So how did that get started in Guatemala? Because Guatemala does not seem to me like a libertarian bastion that would you know, see a school like this sprout up. So Yeah, uh, so it's, uh, it's the story of Muso Ayau, a uh, very famous Guatemalan in where I'm from, uh, who studied at the University of Chicago under uh, Hayek. And so... Really? Yes. Uh, so he was a student of Hayek. And uh, his family was, still is, uh, well, he passed away now. Uh, he he you know, studied back in the uh, mid 20th century. And uh, was, <clears throat> I just say, I'm, I'm sure it was very interesting to have been a student of Hayek. Uh, and so uh, when he graduated and he moved back to, to Guatemala, his family was like, all right, you know, take the wheels of, of the enterprise. And he's like, no, 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 no. I love that you have the wheels of the enterprise. You keep doing it, but just you know, give with the profits. I'm going to start a university that's going to be you know of the school that I'm I'm a part of. And so he founded Universidad Francisco Marroquín, UFM.edu, 
and it's the only Austrian economics university in Latin America, as far as I know. Um, and so, he, the at the time Guatemala had a national university that's three hundred years old that was you know a leader in academia, but had been falling uh, you know down the fiat rabbit hole, and, and the, you know the quality was, was going down. And so this private university kind of filled that niche of people looking for quality education. And so over the past 50 years or so, the Guatemalan elite have sent their kids to that school. Really? Indeed. Uh, if they didn't go study abroad. Uh-huh. But so, that's considered like the, the, the top school, school in, in, by far. in Guatemala. Well, for certain things. Okay. So there's another university that's more from like the USAID realm, which is called Universidad del Valle. And then there's a Catholic university uh, Landivar, and you know, there's a bunch of schools. How, how big, like in a graduating class, how, how big of a... I don't know. I, I was part of the, the MBA program at one point and, and quit halfway because I realized that MBA programs are, you know, kind of a money sinkhole and you'd be better off just starting, you know, <laughs> putting that money into your business. Was the MBA in English or in Spanish? Yeah. So a lot of the classes are in English. So I was okay. a part of their second MBA program because they have two competing ones. It's called the Acton MBA. And I took this course called Life of Meaning. Uh, that uh, really changed my perspective on stuff and realized that I, I, I was wasting my capital that I could use to start a, a business. And it's funny, you know, you go to school, <laughs> you realize it, it was actually a really unique program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but they were probably fine with that because if that's what their, their leaning was. Well, on, uh, on, at, at the business school, though, so they were, there's legends of, uh, you know, a dude coming to Marroquin and giving a Bitcoin talk back in like 2010 or something and literally like handing out paper wallets to all attendees with five Bitcoin in it. Uh, wow. I shit you not. And so the, <laughs> none of them hodled or they lost it. Like I've yet to find someone that's like, yeah, no, I've, I've still got that. Yeah. And so then there was also, I've got a friend who was in the finance uh, MBA program who at one point uh, you got for, for like uh, extra credit in your MBA program, they would give you Bitcoin. Um, and again, you know, low and hodled and et cetera. But that's how Guatemala got exposed to Bitcoin okay. very early on through this, you know. The, and is that, is are they connected to the, what was that, Liberland? Liber Liberland. Uh, so there was, a, Universidad Francisco Marroquín has a very colored history and I, I can, suggest some folks to come in and, and speak to it. I'm not a very good, uh, you know, historian of Marroquín. Uh -huh. And just from my perspective is um, it's always seen as it's been throughout my life seen as the elite school within Guatemala. And so, yeah, that's where the elites send their uh, students. And so the hope was that over time, you know, the libertarian Austrian school would rub off on the elite. In practice, what's happened is the opposite, in my personal opinion. The the conservative... And is, is that because the school has changed what they're teaching, or it just hasn't really... There's a lot of things. Guatemala is very complicated, but uh, I guess if you had to pinpoint to one cause, in my opinion, it's that the schools have filled a political role in that they literally sit on certain boards that have you know, the power to elect certain government officials. And so you know, the, the school was, all, was founded from the beginning with a very activist approach. The reason Guatemala is a statistical aberration in terms of monetary policy, and I invite all Bitcoiners to look at all world currencies over the past 20 years, and you will find that the Guatemalan Quetzal our national currency is an aberration, particularly when you compare it across Latin America. And, and the reason was that Musso, the founder of the school, was very politically active and was able to set locks into our central bank. And so money issuance is prohibited in Guatemala. Okay. And so that's a big reason why the Guatemalan Quetzal is disturbingly stable. And it... I always assumed that it had some type of artificial peg that... that... Yes. Uh, if the Guatemalan Quetzal were allowed to float, it would actually appreciate versus the dollar. Really? So as opposed to the rest of Latin America that is suffering from hyperinflation, Guatemala would actually uh, be stuck in a deflationary cycle that would bankrupt our export industry and would further cause even more uh, joblessness and increase uh, migratory patterns. And so... 
they've found, in my opinion, a hack where they're not allowed to print money, but they are allowed to play with the all the dollars that are being sent by migrants to keep the to essentially inflate the currency to keep it from appreciating and bankrupting exporters. And do you think that's part of the reason? Because I've found in general Guatemala seems cheaper than El Salvador. Do you think that that's... No, I think that's probably the Venezuelan influence over the past 20 years in El Salvador. Um, just the state coming in and paying a bunch of people a bunch of free money, whereas in Guatemala, um, we've always just had a larger industry and larger workforce. And so kind of the okay. the beachhead of the Central American economy where we're always the big dogs. Yeah. Right? So it's yeah. Just interesting. <laughs> I didn't I didn't mean to get off on that tangent, but I've, I've always heard these little bits and pieces about that university. And so I was like, all right, here's my chance to find out what the It's a much longer is. story that I'm so. very, you know, very happy to go yeah. into. But so. OK, know, so back back to what you were originally talking about. Yeah. So uh, let's see. So this, you know, is a part of that elite in Guatemala that was exposed to Bitcoin early on, but, you know, didn't really think about it. And I was working at a company, uh, you know, I was born and raised in Guatemala, went to school in the States, uh, Chapel Hill in North Carolina, came back to Guatemala and started working with a company uh, that uh, overnight was placed on the... Uh, what What... What type of school did you, did you go to a bilingual school in Guatemala? I went to a bilingual school in Guatemala okay. City, Colegio Interamericano. Okay. And yeah, you know, had American, well, United States and Canadian teachers uh, since kindergarten. Yeah. And so, I mean, you don't have much, you don't really have an accent at all. So. My grandmother is originally from Illinois. Okay. And my mom was raised in both the U.S. and Guatemala. And so, technically, my mother's tongue is English. Okay. And so even in the house, sometimes you would. I would speak, speak English with my mom and my cousins who lived in the states, okay. uh, and then at school in my English classes, uh, but in Spanish with my brothers and my dad, and so yeah, I was always the weirdo, um, and yeah, so I uh, moved back home, uh, started working with a company that. I'm sorry, I'm going to keep interrupting you here sure. just because I'm curious to your history. Did you have any thoughts when you like? Finish school there of, of staying in the U.S. Or yes. Did you know all along that you were going to come back to Guatemala? Or I so my my dad also studied in the states, uh, and so I was raised with the, this concept of uh, moving back and and giving back. Right, it's like uh, uh, noblesse oblige would be what my mom would tell me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, nobility obligates you. Uh, it's uh, you know, if, if those with privilege and education don't invest in, in the culture, then then we're going to, I mean, the country is definitely not going anywhere. So the brain drain idea. Yeah. And my dad moved back home and, and started a company. And so I was like very big part of my grandfather as well. He studied abroad and moved back to Guatemala. And so we have this history of many generations of starting things and, and, and being involved in, uh, locally. And so uh, I studied economics and entrepreneurship in North Carolina. And I did want to, my plan was to uh, work abroad because the idea of like being in Guatemala, is, it's, 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 it's a bigger economy than El Salvador, but it's still trivially, trivially small. And so it's hard to get away from the shadow. Guatemala says like 14 million? 18, 18 million, million? Okay. Uh, allegedly, but we don't do the census anymore. And so it's probably more, but let's call it 18 million. So the, the, the rule of thumb is uh, Guatemala is about three times as large as El Salvador okay. in basically everything. Um, and so I decided to, well, I graduated in 2009, so uh, financial crisis of 2008, uh, I was graduating from economics uh, in, in, in North Carolina. I realized this is a terrible time to go into the job market in the, in the U.S. And so I did play around with just moving to New York because I, I wanted experience outside of Guatemala uh, because if you just... It, you're under the shadow of your family, et cetera. And so it's like to prove that I, I could you know, hold my own weight. Yeah. And so I did get a job in, in Belize and in Costa Rica, and I was kind of going the route of working internationally. But I realized I had no, um, I was working in like the international aid sector. And I realized this, this is, uh, now I understand it as infected by fiat and just kind of an extension of the fiat uh, inventions of 1950. Um, and my dad was starting a new a, a new branch of the company. And so I decided to move back and, and help him with it. So we were starting this company. I was starting a... What type of company? Uh, metal structures and roofing. 
Uh, so it's curved roofs. You, uh-huh. If you've ever seen a curved roof in Central America, so we, my dad was the one that brought that initially okay. in the 80s. Uh, and so I had started a, a business, a uh, solar panel uh, business, since we you know, knew how to install roofs, we could also install so- solar panels. Um, and at one point, uh, all of a sudden, overnight, uh, we were placed, or some of the businesses in our family enterprise or business group were placed on the Office of Foreign Assets Control uh, specially designated terrorist and king, drug kingpin watch list out of the United States Treasury Department. Uh, we literally found out reading the newspaper. Really? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, 35 years of yeah. running the business, uh, two bankruptcies, I mean, struggling, employing over 150 people, uh, building cool stuff, you know, and, and then all of a sudden we're, we're placed on this list. And very quickly found out the importance and the value of censorship-resistant money because uh, you are assumed guilty until yeah. proven innocent. Which I had friends in the State Department uh, from my college days, and I reached out. I was like, "What the hell is this? Like, how do you, how do I even like? Yeah, what? how do you even start to clear your name? Oh and God, uh, like, yeah, how, there's there's nothing. I, I found out reading a newspaper that had a list, and then." We went to the bank and, and the manager's saying, you know, the banks don't cash our checks. Like, there's money in the bank. I'm, I'm looking at the balance. We've been using these accounts for years and they're literally saying that they cannot cash our checks. And so my dad had been involved in, in the banking system. He had got a meeting with the president of the central bank to ask, you know, where in the Guatemalan constitution does it say that the United States Treasury Department can freeze the bank accounts of foreign citizens. It's like very, a very clear answer of it's not in the Guatemalan Constitution. This is beyond our legal code. This is literally the when you get on this list, any Guatemalan bank, any bank anywhere in the world is told if a dime moves from these accounts, you are eliminated from the SWIFT yep. network. Your entire bank is eliminated from the SWIFT network. Which is a death knell. Not only is it a death knell for the bank, it also puts the entire banking system for that country at risk because it effectively immediately sets off a bank run. Yeah. And so it's 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 the the gun to the head to the banking system and so there is no assuming, you know, in this you know, pro- until proven guilty. And of course Yeah, they they could know that you're innocent, but it wouldn't matter cuz they're like our hands are tied, we're not going to risk. No, but, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, we know, we know, you. Yeah. like, it must be some mistake, but I don't know, take it up with the United States Treasury yeah. Department. And I don't know, I, I couldn't find their hotline number. <laughs> uh, I did find an email. And so we wrote an email and then we spent months uh, waiting and finally got an email saying that they required 15 years worth of financial audited uh, statements, which we prepared. In the meantime, all of our competitors are saying, hey, you know, they're on the OFAC list, you know, drug kingpins or terrorists, you know, apparently I'm a terrorist. Uh, and so we've compiled all the information and sent it and, you know, crossing our fingers because it was just a random email. And 18 months later, got a letter saying, you are no longer on the list. But the Department of Treasury reminds you that you will be put on the list at any moment in time. And if you ever engage in a little, it's like not even a sorry or yeah, like yeah, yeah. anything, you know, acknowledgement of mistake. It was more of an assertion of the power that they wield some, you know, government bureaucrat. And as a result, um, the company eventually went out of business, put us further into debt, forced us to fire over 150 people who were feeding over 150 families who I'm sure ended up as migrants uh, working uh, very well trained uh, metal workers, you know, so we trained them well and they're now, you know, setting up roofs and building stuff in the United States, most more than likely. Uh, but so it kind of just, uh, but it, you know. <laughs> did you ever find out like why you guys so, wound up on that list? It's a very what? long story. Uh, it was essentially a mistake, um, but uh, it's very, it's a, that's, yeah. that's the short story. Of it, then it took eighteen. And this months. happens all the time. You guys oh, are not, you know, some random damage. exception. I mean, this is all the time. These type things happen. The OFAC list is a, is the worst. It's like the absolute extreme. It's con, it's known as financial death, right? So, it's I I like to think of it as the equivalent of a, a you know drone in Afghanistan 
mistakenly killing a innocent family. Yeah. Like that's the equivalent, but in, in Latin America where we've been at war with the United States with the war on drugs since the early 70s, but people just kind of forget and don't really consider it a war and it's evolved into this financial war. And so we are collateral damage and just realizing that it took me a long time to, you know, obviously we went into debt. It was, it was terrible. I, you know, I, I, I'm, at the time it felt like the worst thing that ever happened to me. I was very depressed. I considered suicide. My dad almost died. Like it was, it was just very, yeah. very hard. So uh, infuriating. Yeah. So angry. And you don't even have any, any face to be angry at. But now I understand and I am thankful. I thank the United States Treasury Department for ripping the blindfold off of our eyes. Um, and so I'm very awake as to what the reality is and, and, and how the world actually works, not how you hoped it would work or were taught that it could work at a you know, United States uh, economics school that is a Keynesian inspired and just yeah. realizing, wow, like there's, there's, the world has very deep problems and the only thing that fixes this is Bitcoin. Um, and yeah. I always tell uh, the, you know, because I have friends at the embassy here and, and the U.S. embassy and I'll, I'll be like, you guys should at least have to adhere to the same regulations that you push on the country here because they don't realize, and, and this is small compared to what you and your family face, but they don't realize all of the friction and how hard it is to do anything because of U.S. pressure because they have their own bank branches there. If you work with the U.S. Embassy, you don't have to go through all the stuff that anybody else has to do to open a bank account. They do all these things so they have no idea the havoc they cause for everybody else because they're exempted from it. It's like, hey, you created these rules. You should at least be subject to them so you realize how bad they are. Which is why many banks have just developed a policy of we won't deal with Americans, yeah. for example. And yes, no, being American is like on par with being from like North Korea almost. I mean, it's like, no, we don't we don't want to deal with you if you're an American. If you have that blue passport, forget it, because it's you're way more trouble than it's worth. You're a liability. Yeah. And it's actually at this point, my I, my perspective is that it is a serious um, problem for the long term health of the American empire because it's making the you know citizens, American citizens abroad have a our liability, whereas you, you should be pushing yeah. your citizens to be business leaders and and you know be well received. If it, if you're making it harder, that's just going to you know reduce your soft power influence across the world. And it's happening. Real, a buddy of mine was was in Switzerland. I'm not name the company, but hmm? he said like they would not. He w he was American, but he said they kind of had a policy, an unspoken policy of not bringing in any more Americans because it was just so frustrating and hard to try to get them bank accounts and all these other things. They're like, no, we just hire from somewhere else. So now you have Americans like at a disadvantage compared to the rest of the world because of what the U.S. government's doing. It's uh, a, a very obvious way where the United States empire is shooting itself in the foot at the height of its power yeah. and just clobbering itself. And he's like, wow, it's like there's this clown world on steroids. And we just really want to go down in flames as quickly as possible. So, yeah, anyway, that's... So that opened your eyes to you, you need a, a censorship-resistant money. Torturous, torturous process. Um, and, uh, yeah, so just realizing this... this we you know, never put myself in that position ever again. Yeah. Uh, and so slowly rebuild. In the meantime, you know, I... When I, I, I I did the public service scholar program in Chapel Hill. I, I was raised in Guatemala when uh, in the 90s I had new people that were kidnapped, you know, literally like the buses were stopped and dudes with guns got on the bus and were like, we want so and so. And they would like bring them down on, off of the bus. And, you know, I remember that being a big thing in Guatemala. It, it never was really a thing in El Salvador, but in Guatemala, especially them targeting certain families. Yep. Uh, so, yeah. So, so like I, I, I knew people that that happened to. And so, you know, in, in this very unsecure environment, uh, I had armed guards that would take me to the bus stop and you know, stuff like that growing up where, where it's like we, and, and, and so you're growing up in high school wanting, and I, I was always 
wanting to get involved in things, but it's like, no, you, you, you yeah. kind of just go to school, go home. And, and when I went to UNC and, and Chapel Hill and realizing, wow, like this is, this is what- this So is, free, I can go wherever I want. And I don't need a bodyguard with me. Exactly, and, and, and I found the, the public service scholar program and realized there's this really strong service culture there that I, 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 I never knew I had. And it just really, uh, you know, I guess, you know, resonated with me and got super involved in, in, in that. And so when I moved back, I was like very interested in finding those kinds of opportunities because I think it's important that society creates moments where people from all walks of life meet each other. And, yeah. and the problem is when you when society starts to deconstruct, you lose this, the common spaces where anyone, you can have a conversation with anyone. And so you can actually empathize or sympathize with someone because you've had the chance to hear them directly and, and, and shake their hand and look at them in, in the eyes instead of hear someone tell you about what they're, so that group of people think and what they want, right? And so that's the, the, the biggest problem of insecurity is you lose those spaces. And so the elites, the, the, the bottom of the pyramid, whatever you want to, however you want to classify. They don't mix. They don't mix. Yeah. And so everyone's in their echo chambers and usually that leads to conflict. Um, and so one of the places that I found that uh, people told me about was the voting tables. Every four years in Guatemala, we vote. We have a general election that just replaces the entire government that we choose, that we elect. And so every four years, that happens. And what we have is a system that came out of our revolution in 1982. And so it was literally our last victory as a people was our election process. We took it back from the army that you know we voted in the 60s and the 70s with, you know, who do you want to vote for, right? Like, that was basically the process. Yeah. Or better yet, the way I think it was Lenin that said, it's like, it doesn't matter uh, who votes, it's who counts the votes, right? And so the vote counting was literally done by the police in you know some basement somewhere. And so the revolution in the 80s, a big part of it was the people saying, we're sick of these sham elections. And kind of a stroke of genius and luck, uh, the guy behind it, which is, I consider a Satoshi Nakamoto figure, Arturo Gerbrujer Asturias, in 1982 was charged as a result of the revolution was put in charge of the national voting system 85 year old man brilliant legal mind a lawyer constitutionalist and was told design the best voting system you can imagine and he decided what we need to do is empower the people and so what we do in guatemala is we have these voting tables within your neighborhood and so about 400 citizens are assigned to each table and you show up and there's your neighbor's there and they give you the ballots and you mark it with a you know, paper, you know, pencil, pen, crayon, whatever, and you deposit it into these bags in front of your neighbors. And so that experience is actually a, an opportunity to meet your neighbors, right? And it's like, because everyone's mobilized, it's the one day that it's actually pretty peaceful, right? Uh, we have a long history of not having crime or violence around elections. Certain places do have their problems, but it's pockets, right? Yeah. And so everyone's on the street. And so it's this amazing experience when you vote. It's literally referred to in Guatemala as uh, la fiesta civica, the civic party. Right? It's like, but party not in the political party, yeah. but like literally yeah, yeah. a party. Like, like everybody's together. Everybody's out uh, on the street. Celebrating. Whereas usually people yeah. are inside their homes afraid. Now, like, because everyone's on the street, it's safe. And so I became just a, just just sure. curious. I'm sorry. Another yeah, side yeah. note here. Do, do they prohibit alcohol sales yes, on that day? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is it like in because they do that in El Salvador? Yep. You can't you can't buy alcohol. I don't know if it's like the day of the election. I think a couple yeah. days afterwards, but two, two days before and the day after. As as human nature would be, it becomes like one of the biggest uh, weeks for sale of alcohol because everybody's so worried Hoards. they won't be able to buy on those days. They like hoard. They stock up before, yeah. so all the beer companies do big displays the week before. And uh, yeah, it's it's very healthy in general. Um, and but the. What I'm most excited about and what I joined was the ranks of the volunteers. And at this point, Guatemala mobilizes almost 25,000 of these tables. There's a minimum of three, but an average of four to five citizens to each table. And so it's like... Like watching. In charge of the table. In charge of the table. You get a big box full of all of the ballots, all the materials you need. And so the way I got recruited was my uncle ran, uh, was with a team that ran a whole voting center. It's the largest voting center in Guatemala in the, in the country. It's got like a hundred tables. There's this like logistical you know thing where 
you know, he, he basically create this tradition and this uh, pride, this 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 uh, constant you know, culture and habit of people are always every four years like oh, we're going back to our thing, right? And we do our thing, and we're we're it's 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 our it's we're proud to run this, right? Because yeah. it's the people, and so it's literally just uh, people calling each other. Who do you who can you trust to actually show up? Because if you don't show up, you're causing real problems, right? And so it's an interesting network of the most reliable people, which again in Latin America, it's very hard sometimes to find reliable people, uh, but you can find them. And it's about 3% of the population. And so three out of every hundred people are very reliable, right? And uh, that's how we generate this army of people that are in charge of the votes. And it's just a, an honor to serve, right? And when you're there, you know, it's very hard work. You have to show up at three in the morning. You you have to stay till you're done. You're technically a mayor for a day, and your jurisdiction is your table. So you're legally protected from uh, being arrested by the cops or the military. Like no one can remove you from the table until you have finalized your document. And what your document is is all the people cast their vote. You receive them, and the entire time you have witnesses from the political parties sitting literally right behind you, and so they're like watching everything you do. So over time, now I realize the voting volunteers are like mining nodes in Bitcoin. And the political witnesses are validating nodes. They verify that the protocol rules were followed, but the hashing is done by the volunteers. And so at the end of the day, you dump all the ballots in top of the table and you count every single one individually, one by one, showing it to every witness. This happens in a decentralized fashion all across the country simultaneously with over 200,000 people. So it's a lot of people, a lot of eyes that once they're on the paper, that makes that that document has integrity, right? Yeah. And so the document acts kind of like a coin join where over 400 people are assigned to a table and you add up. So it's their tally sheets, vote tally sheets that say, all right, out of 300 people, 20 votes went to this guy. And if, I mean, maybe we can switch over. Yeah, you're you're right. The it's better to see the example, but uh, um, I don't know if we're and and yeah, yeah, no, yeah. we'll pull it up. But and so sure. those um, like everybody agrees on those that those are the like the numbers, like the because you have people from different political parties and you have the, yeah. the people in charge of the table. The other one, yeah, go the, the yellow one. Yeah, so basically, here is an example. You can see Julio, Fernando, Chocano, Javier, Interno, three people, Maria de Los Angeles Lopez, and their CUI numbers. And then down at the upper right, uh, there are three signatures. So th those are the signatures of the three mining nodes of that table. And then below them, you have UNE Valor and their signatures and their CUI numbers. Those are all the political party witnesses. So let's say, you know, if, if you go back up, is, those... is just just for clarification, are these yeah. all candidates? On the left, you can see code 15, 32, 41, and this is UNE, Azul, Valor, Cabal. Every one of those numbers is assigned to a political party that's competing. And this one is the presidential election. So you do have over 25 competitors. Wow. OK. It's insane. Uh, yes. It's the appearance of decentralization, but the consolidation of a proof of stake system. But I digress. Uh, so yeah, your your friends are the mining nodes that are with you, but then the political party witnesses they they represent the political party. Yeah. So it's so random. they're not going to sign off unless they unless they've got every vote they and, think they got. And if they can prove that you did something wrong, you can go to jail, right? So that signature there means this document was done the way it's supposed to, and none of these people really know each other, right? They were just assigned there, and that's what I mean that it's this moment, this place, I, I consider them sacred places that we still have that bring us together as citizens and break down those barriers where you finally are able to talk to someone that's a political party representative of that party that you've only heard of. And you can, yeah. and you're sitting next to each other for like 16 hours doing all this hard work. So it's like you, you, you break the ice and eventually you're like, you find out who's who's there with the right reasons and, and you, you realize you know, most people are just there to do a job and, yeah. and they, they want what's best for their community and, and they try their best, right? And so basically I found these parallels, right, of what 
the voting table volunteers do are effectively mining nodes. The witnesses are validating nodes. The product is a coin join. So you can see it says 272 votes distributed like that. And so there's we could find out the registry of this table and find the 272 citizens assigned. But I would never be able to know if you voted for the blue party because there's a one in 272 chance that you voted for that party. So it's it it's a coin join in that it makes the information public of the transaction yeah. block, but it protects people's privacy. privacy. However, because it's an election, you want the information to be public because then all you need to do is make all of these documents available to the public so that anyone can run the audit to confirm whether or not the election results are actually true. And so that's where our democracy in Guatemala, I think is one of the best in the world because we can actually prove for ourselves who won. We don't have to just trust the authority that says we ran the numbers and this is the winner. We can actually yeah. run it ourselves. No, I mean, this seems way better than the way we do it in the US. <laughs> the US is very complicated, but yeah, there are I, I, el electronic voting, so e voting and then voting at machines. You, and at the end of the day, you're trusting a black box. And how are you going to? Maybe the, the company is doing their best job, but if you can't explain this to the layman, yeah. I mean, Guatemala creates distrust. Guatemala is a, a country where most people, like, I, I don't know what the reading and writing rates are, but when I grew up, it was like over 60% of people can't read and write. And so, this is something that people understand. Like it's like showing them the vote with the little X marked on it. It's like another one to, for that line. And you just yeah. sum all this up. That's your hashing function. You, you just take the tally. And if everyone's cool with it, they sign and that's it. And so the tricky bit is since there are 25,000 voting tables, it means that every election is producing 25,000 of these. And since there's over 20, uh, parties per or competing, it means that there are 20 data points per every single document. And there are five elections. So there are 125,000 times 20. It's like 3 million data points. And so it's a, the election authority is like, every, anyone can verify it. You just have a week to do it. And so this whole process really put me down the, the rabbit hole. And so that's why if we go back to the, the Canva, you know, my whole stick is I came for democracy, but I stayed for Bitcoin. I believe that w elections happen all over the world and they are increasingly bad because of people's growing distrust and the incapacity of this, the state and the bureaucrats and the clown world to just do, do their job. And so I think Bitcoiners have an opportunity to use the elections and all of the negative energy around that and all of the election deniers or, or people, dis distrusting people that result, that feel like they got shafted, uh, to expose them to Bitcoin, to expose. See, uh, elections have, in the elections industry, there's a thing called post-election audits. So there are people in your community, and the U.S. has many organizations that specialize in post-election audits. And so those guys, the post-election auditors, are essentially the Bitcoiners of the election system. They don't trust, they verify. And so there is a tradition there from even cryptography of doing this that I think we can use so that instead of all this negative energy going to waste, just creating more distrust between people, that we can use those elections to push people to understand, get exposed to yeah. Bitcoin in a very different... Well, understand just the, the importance of a trustless system. Of a system that you can verify for yeah. yourself, right? That's the point. And, and so I'm using the Guatemalan system to reach the citizen army that I'm a part of to try to orange pill all 100,000 volunteers to say the don't trust verify philosophy that our democracy is built upon uh, is the same one that Bitcoin is built on. And I also found uh, some problems with it back in 2019 when I evolved from being a volunteer to being a political party witness. And so I went from being a mining node to a validating node. And it just so happened that in 2019, our system collapsed very publicly. People went to jail. Uh, and, uh, you know, denial is a very strong 
or you know kind of instinct in yeah. humans and so to me it was very clear and it continues to be very clear that the guatemalan elections of 2019 were the product of fraud uh, i just couldn't prove it and the burden of proof was on on me i saw it happen but i i couldn't and i tried and is when i discovered the open timestamps protocol which was built by Peter Todd. And and because what you saw was that they were changing those sheets. Like... As as a witness, I had access to the database where all of those documents were supposed to be fed in real time and it was supposed to go from 0 to 105,000 and I saw it go from 10 to 5, 20 to 10, 50 to 20, 60 to 10, 90 to 10, 100 to 0, 100 to 0 and it's like that's not how a database works a yeah. database goes from zero to a hundred if there are interruptions it means that something bad is happening maybe the system just crashed maybe it's there's a logical explanation but i need to see yeah. the receipt creates distrust and at a minimum yes and so um that changing of the documents immediately made me think that the only way we would be able to trust the election authorities is if, if we figured out a way to organize a massive amount of people to verify all of these documents. And that's where, uh, you know, I, I, yeah, Fiscal Digital, maybe, so on the, on the top left. Uh, Fiscal Digital, the tab on the very, very left. On the left, 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 left. There you go. Fiscal Digital, I created this as FiscalDigital.net, or the logos you, you have on the presentation. Uh, fiscal digital in, in Guatemala, fiscal is uh, a term for someone that witnesses. So uh, it's not fiscal digital, it's yeah. fiscal digital. Because I mean, that's also the word they use for like prosecutors, right? It's exactly. Like, yeah. So it's, it's a prosecutor, it's an overseer, it's a witness. It's the person that's responsible for not trusting but verifying. Okay. And so the political parties have their fiscales and they're known as fiscal de mesa. The, 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 voting table witness. And so I realized we need digital witnesses on the voting system where if we figure out a way to gamify this and invite a new uh, generation of people to verify the results, then uh, we'll able to independently come to a conclusion as to whether or not we can trust the results. So I tried doing that in 2019, built an open source system inspired by CAPTCHA, essentially the just got over 1,500 volunteers that all came into the system and started working on it. But um, they, the authorities came out with the election results and when that happened, volunteers lost interest. And so if you're requiring volunteers to give you the work and you can't motivate them when they lose interest, it's hard. Yeah. And so in 2019, you know, I used Bitcoin as the time stamping Mm -hmm. 19 or 23? 19. Oh, okay, Before 19. starting this, because the, the message is anyone can do this. You should, if you're curious about elections, please get involved in them as a post-election auditor. Find the organizations that already do this. They're usually strapped for resources. And uh, they're, I think, perfectly primed to be, be orange-pilled. So find the post-election auditors in your community and see how you can help them. Because they're probably going to be open to hearing about Bitcoin if they're not Bitcoiners already. And um, we uh, tried to perform this audit and we used Bitcoin to timestamp all of the data. And I'm sorry, this is like very confusing, I'm sure. But um, when what, we- What do you mean you used Bitcoin to timestamp? Sure. Explain, explain how exactly. that works. So uh, if you run your own node on Bitcoin, there is a function called the op return function. It allows you to enter arbitrary data into a transaction. And so Peter Todd, one a very well-known Bitcoin Core developer, developed a protocol called the Open Timestamps Protocol. You can go to opentimestamps.org. What this does is every so often, depending on how frequently you want to do this, but you could do this every block, you can send a transaction to the Bitcoin chain that's a zero sat transaction that just pays the minor fee that includes arbitrary arbitrary data in the op return function is is that like the same way like the you know the the first 
was I think it was in the first block how it said, you know, the banks on the it, It's inspired by that. Okay. And so in the case of a mining node, you can do you can sign messages into the block. Okay. And so, so that's different. That's it's it's okay. slightly different, but it's 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 the it's the same idea of, of entering some data. And so Satoshi entered, you know, uh, Chancellor on the second uh, uh, on the brink of the second bailout of banks. But that's through actually into the block. Any user, any node runner can use the op return function to enter arbitrary data into a transaction. Okay. So you don't need to be the miner that won that block. block. You could just be anyone, okay. any transaction that got onto that block that paid the you know, miner fee that makes sure to get on the next block. And so, uh, but the, the way the protocol works, uh, open timestamps, is you create a hash of a document, but if you have many documents, you can hash them on top of each other and come down to one final hash that through a series of mathematical proofs, you can prove that they can, their hash is related to the hash that actually went on Bitcoin. So in this way, you use the blocks in Bitcoin as a reference for time. Bitcoin becomes your notary that gives you a timestamp to say that data exists at least as of when this block exists and you yeah. can find the time when that block exists and so you can say a set of data is at least as old as this moment so it's effectively carbon dating for digital data and the way the reason this is useful and i highly encourage people to find peter todd's talks on open timestamps it's because the bad guys don't have time machines no one has a time machine as far as we know and so if at one moment you have a document that you want to make sure no one messes with, you timestamp it to Bitcoin. And as long as you keep that document stored in your own personal server or wherever, you can wait, you know, a thousand years could go by and you could prove that this document is the exact same as that document that existed a thousand years ago. And that's incredibly valuable because if you go to court and someone is saying, but this was the contract that you signed. And you look at the contract, it's like, I didn't sign that. I don't owe Mike a million dollars. Like, I, I, we agreed on a dollar. Like, you... We denominated it in Satoshis. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, dollars, so. So, if that were to happen to you, if you had a situation like that, and you had timestamped it to Bitcoin, you could always say, but here's the original yeah. contract, and I can prove that this, this contract that I'm showing you that doesn't exist today, it exists since this previous moment. And so if we're in front of a judge and you can't prove that, then probably I have a better case, right? So in the, in the case of elections, this is extremely valuable because as elections are happening, if you can timestamp all of that data as it's coming in and as it's created, you've essentially created forensic information using Bitcoin that can allow people to determine what the probabilities are that a certain document is real or fake. You effectively reduce 99% of the attack surface of an election to a very, very small moment in time the beginning right yeah so they would in order to to fraudulently impact the election they would have to attack each table at that point they can't do it in aggregate or they would have had to prepare the attack previously and be ready for it but because elections correspond to certain voting patterns you'd have to take a huge gamble yeah. on predicting what kind of voting pattern would go unnoticed, right? So it essentially means that attackers of elections that are trying to commit election fraud would have to have insane amounts of compute power to predict all sorts of variables that are effectively impossible. And so what it doesn't make it impossible, but it raises the bar to a level that most places don't have, right? Yeah. And if you also do it these, in a decentralized way, then you have to hit all of these places simultaneously. And so, yes, it. Um, so I did that before running my election audit because I also think if, if you're going to run an audit on an election and you're going to potentially contradict the election results, you also require the timestamp. Because if you contradict the election authorities, you might go to jail. In Guatemala, it's a crime. And I. I could be charged with treason. 
And so I, I realized... I, if you call into question the election results. If I contradict the election authorities' election results, I could be charged with treason. And at the very least, they could say that I altered the election mm -hmm. documents. And so you, the burden of proving that you've never tampered with the election results is on you. So you get the official election documents, you timestamp them to Bitcoin, and then you start to run an audit. So the experience of attempting this in 2019 led us to make a bunch of recommendations and we caused a lot of noise and we became you know, kind of viral in Guatemala. And so this year, uh, another group called Simple Proof uh, decided to try and build a system to do this officially for the government. And that's why if you go to YouTube, uh, I helped them, yep, I helped them uh, with a documentary. It's a 16 minute documentary, so a lot simpler and easier to understand than this uh, rambling um, of mine. Uh, it's a 16 minute documentary that basically creates the, we have the opportunity now through Bitcoin and the Open Timestamps protocol um, to create immutable democracies. And so it, m my idea is it would be great if all democracies were immutable because a mutable democracy is no bueno, right? If, uh, if the results can change over yeah. time, then it means that, but if we can make them immutable and there are certain characteristics that allow for democracies to be more immutable than others. So this documentary tells that story of how this company Simple Proof was able to convince the Guatemalan election authorities called the Tribunal Supremo Electoral to use this service called the immutable backup to ensure that all election documents in Guatemala are timestamped to Bitcoin and therefore arguably immutable or you know tamper tamper evident yeah. is the right term but that's less sexy so uh, it's the originals are immutable in that you can prove that using Bitcoin and so yes it's Guatemala is the first country in the world to have used Bitcoin to protect its election integrity. So just a logistical question, this, yep. this same system wouldn't really work in the, the US because of the electronic voting machines and the way, I mean, it worked in Guatemala because of the system that they had. Is that correct or am I missing something? Yes, I would say that's incorrect um, in that the United States has 50 states. Every single state has its own election law that's passed by the legislative and then as I understand it, but I may be wrong, the county clerk, so each county and the county clerk specifically is responsible for interpreting the election law to carry out the votes in that county under the rules that are set by each state. So certain states may have a paper-based system where there are vote tally sheets or the equivalent okay. of a vote tally that you could do this with so that you could use this, but it depends on how each state has that. I know there's been a lot of things happening in elections in the states, so maybe certain people have lobbied and improved the election systems enough where they've removed the black boxes. However, even in e-voting, you could, there's always some proof, right? And so whatever proof, whatever election documents exist, they should be timestamped to Bitcoin because that's the only way that we can prove that they haven't been altered. So my message would be, if you care about elections in your county, in your state, find the post-election auditors and go ask them the simple question, hey, if I wanted to audit the election, how do I do this? Yeah. What, what would I go about? And the hope would be that you could get your hands on the primary source documents. Not a secondary, you know, this is the receipt that the machine gave you but rather this is the primary source, the unaltered from the source, wherever that is, that has the results and then verify that, right? I cannot say that I know that, that, that it's impossible in the States. I think certain places yeah, it is impossible, yeah, yeah. but there's gotta be some place where you can yeah, do this. Yeah, and I'm sure yeah like you said, it's so, it's so many different systems are, are used it's there and it's all brought together. But I think, I mean, I think no matter what side you're on politically, pretty much everybody believes that the next election is going to be disputed, that both sides are going to feel like, you know, it was fraudulent. And so I think this is more important than ever. Well, that's the hope. And, and it's, uh, you know, Latin America, well, 
this, the, what I described in Guatemala in, in terms of our citizen army is our victory from our revolution in the 80s. It was so successful. People thought the guy was crazy because the idea of like giving citizens the votes would, was like, you're crazy. In a country of uh, illiterate people, like this is not going to work. Never going to work. You're insane. But then it worked. And so it was such a miraculous like uh, thing that the guy that built the, the system was taken around Latin America to tell everyone how successful this was. And so in the 90s, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Bolivia, Ecuador, all copied our systems because they were all coming out of like their own little tr troubles. And so the, the country, El Salvador has the most similar voting system to Guatemala than anywhere else on earth. And so, and other places in Latin America have very similar processes as well. And next year we have elections in El Salvador, Costa Rica, Mexico, Panama, uh, Dominican Republic, Uruguay, Chile, I think, and Brazil, all before the USA elections. So I think my message to Bitcoiners is let's run full nodes. Let's audit as many elections as we can to send the message that Bitcoin fixes elections. Bitcoin, or maybe not fixes, but Bitcoin provides a much, much higher level of transparency and can bring trust back to people in elections, particularly those that distrust. And even if you fail, because I failed miserably in 2019, even if you fail, you still reach people that hear about Bitcoin in a different way. And I think the sound money argument is super valuable, but we've reached kind of the limits of the people that are interested in this. Yeah. And so this is, uh, you know, election deniers and teenagers are the two main groups that I basically work with here who helps me do this. And I have a hard time thinking about two better audiences of pre-coiners who are primed to grok Bitcoin because of their distrust with a very different message that breaks the FUD of what they've heard that it's not useful for anything. Well, if it's useful for elections, then maybe there's more to it, right? And then I, I know you said one of the challenges in, in 19 was you guys were using volunteers and then they lost interest. Yep. So. Yeah. How did you resolve that? And, and I believe it involved Bitcoin at some point. Yep. Uh, so if we go back to the Canva uh, and uh, page number 42. Uh, so we partnered with a group called a company called Stackwork. Um, I met Polly Toy, uh, the founder, uh, way back when. Uh, yeah, Paul's been to El Salvador several times. I so. actually you know, was also here in Sonte when you were trying to do some of the stack work stuff. And I realized this is so powerful, but it's still kind of like hard yeah. to, to figure out how to do this with people. Right. And so um, figured out how to work with them. And this is the summary of our experience where I was saying we have so many of these data points. And so with their help, we ended up doing. 17 million OCRs, we created these. What is an OCR? An optical character recognition. So it's a machine looking at the data that was handwritten and coming up with a, some type of result. Okay. And so we relied on machines first. And if the machines didn't agree, then we went to two humans, showed them the data. And every time a human hit a job, at first, we were handing out... And this is something they're verifying on their phones. On their phone? They're... Just, they would go to our website, get an SMS message with a, a, a code, send them to the link to Stackwork, log in, uh, and basically just do uh, a series of tests. We uh, had a quality assurance. So if you go to the next slide, uh, over 1,700 people signed up. Uh, we applied a, a, a test to make sure that they were capable of doing the work. So over a thousand qualified. Out of those thousand, 226 earned more than 90,000 sats, which is more or less $30 at the time that they did this. And our top 10 users earned more than 500,000 sats. What's that now? 90,000 sats is probably around uh, 3540, I'd say. Uh, and in total, just to um, people that were election that, that were uh, election deniers and, and teenagers that you know signed up for this, uh, those one thousand over a thousand users, they earned their first sats through this program. So it's effectively a lightning faucet. 
I believe. So when they verify the when they do a certain amount, then they just automatically get sent. They get points. Okay. And so we we didn't mention Bitcoin. It was just this is a game. Compete with your friends and see who can do more for democracy. Now it just so happened that anyone that learned about the Lightning Network could understand that those points were Satoshi's, and if they learned how to create a Lightning invoice, then they would be exposed to their first Lightning transaction. And so over sixty well, over sixty six million Sats were rewarded to users, many of whom figured it out and have experienced their first Lightning transaction, but many more that are going to find out eventually. Yeah. Uh, because since it's a game, we're just going to redo this every single time that there's a, an election. And our top 10 users will be kind of like when you go to an arcade and you see like the top scorers, they're just going to be there. So my goal is to use the elections as a constant reminder every four years for Guatemalans to see this is how many sats were distributed through an election audit. And so if every four years we remind people about sats, this, I hope, will turn into those top users, you know, 10,000 pizza moments. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. No, it'd be great. You see the first people that help verify, you know, they, they have millions of a dollar equivalent in, in Bitcoin. And so I, I, the, the most that we, we, were, that we were rewarding uh, for, for a single job of data entry, and that's literally like writing three numbers on your phone, was 20 sats. And I did numbers, so... 500,000 sats would have been the equivalent of 40 hours of doing this. So those top 10 users spent at least about five days of eight hour work. And so in a week, they earned 500,000 sats, which is what, like uh, $150 to, uh, at, at current exchange rates, more or less. And so it's bringing creating this game back. And it's yeah. like, next time, there's no way we're going to give this amount of sats because yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't think so. Right? It'd be but weird. that helps clarify for them the direction that Bitcoin's moving. And so our time. top our top score, just like the arcades, if you ever played an arcade and you know you saw a top score, they're like, this has been there for like yeah. 10 years. Like no one's going to get this score. No one's ever going to beat their high score. Yeah. And so we use the election as a constant reminder for people of what it would have been like had you saved those sats, right? And so I think that's a, it's my way of using all that propaganda around the election to bring people back to if I had just saved Bitcoin over time, I, you know, auditing an election for a week in 2023 might re turn into retiring, you know, in 2040, right? So it's, I want to, my mission in life is to do everything I can that, so that the 50 million Central Americans that live in this region are among the first people in the world to experience Bitcoin. There's 8 billion people on earth. I see it as a race. And I think we have everything we need in Central America to be the first region to win that race. And if we do, I think it's going to help us become the most prosperous region in the world and peaceful. Uh, yeah. Well, that is that is amazing. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we were able to sit down because you've been talking to me about these things. But, you know, I'm, I'm old and, and half of it was going over my head. I, I, and I'm a visual person, so I need it to be kind of laid out sure. like this. And, uh, and now it makes complete sense. Like, oh, of course, this well, I hope it makes sense. Well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, no, no, and if I understand it, I'm sure everybody else understands it too, because you know I'm a little, a little slow. Um, what uh, sh shifting gears a, a little uh, bit, I'm curious as to what your sense is of in Guatemala in general and their take on Bitcoin. Do you do you see them warming up at all? Are they curious about what's happening in El Salvador? Mm. Are you seeing? more people being orange pilled there or at least curious about it or does it seem like they're focused on other things and so we have an, a peculiar challenge in guatemala in that i mentioned the Universidad francisco marroquín's history and and the um the impact that they had on limiting monetary uh inflation and so guatemala is this weird place in latin america that just doesn't experience inflation or experiences inflation via the dollar, which now yeah. is, is much clearer, but over the past 20, 30 years, the, if you talk to someone from Mexico, Costa Rica, even Salvador, or 
not to mention Argentina and Venezuela, inflation is obvious. So it's hard to get to a Guatemalan from that angle because it's just like, and it's weird because everyone knows someone from Argentina or Mexico, yeah. but you never talk about, you talk about soccer instead of, you know, monetary history, right? And so it just, it's a hard argument to make. At the same time, there's the remittance angle. Uh, and so I'm hopeful. Well, and the, the censorship, I mean, the thing that you and your family face, I'm sure you guys aren't alone in, in that. There's, I, but it's, it's, it's a small, you know, yeah. it's... Uh, we're are the banks, I mean, the banks in El Salvador are horrible to deal with. I mean, that alone, I think, would make people... Is, are the banks better in, in Guatemala? Yeah, they're, they're better. The, the banks are local, primarily locally owned in okay. Guatemala. There's a very strong banking, so very conservative. And so they, you know, 60% or more, or more people are unbanked, but they're very strong. Uh, and so I don't think it's it's from there. It's more of the remittance angle where uh, th our economy at this point, it's probably upwards of 30% of our GDP is from remittances. And so, is that higher than El Salvador's as far as remittances? I don't believe the numbers. I like. I would say it's probably at this point over a third okay. of our GDP is remittances. People would dispute that, I'm sure, but we are sick. We are essentially an, a slave exporter for the United States of second, third class citizens that work their asses off. And the incredible thing about the fiat system is they're convinced that it's the American dream, and so they're happy, right? Like if you go, if you're if you're working, you know, as a hotel janitor in California, you made it compared to staying at home being a farmer, right? Because yeah. uh, that's how wacky the world is, and so that's what we've become. So I'm hopeful that the remittance angle, you know, on average, remittances are paying nine percent. I mean, you've talked about this ad nauseum here. I hope to to folks, where it's if it's ninety nine percent cost around average for remittance. And we're it's twenty percent. That's two percent of our GDP. Yeah. So it's the that is the angle. And then of course, uh, Bukele is a phenom. And had he been allowed to be on the presidential ballot, like we had forty useless clowns, had Bukele been on there, he would have won by a landslide. Yeah. By 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 a landslide in Guatemala and in Honduras and probably, probably pretty much anywhere in Latin America. But definitely next door in yeah. Guatemala. And so, of course, people are, uh, people have heard of Bukele. But the Bitcoin thing, it was like, it, it's, it's something that people ridicule in Salvador because, oh, we're, we have a strong banking system. But the joke's going to be on them uh, very soon. And so, we are, we're, while the rest of the world can ignore it, we can't. Yeah. Uh, El Salvador is Guatemala's second most important trading partner after the United States. So if Bitcoin takes off like a rocket ship uh, and Salvadorans are massively improving their quality of life, it will be the first to know. But that's where... What, what is... Is it mostly like farm, like produce and stuff coming here? Or what's the main trading? I don't know. The I mean, I know are... most, like pretty much all the vegetables and anything like that come... Or come from Guatemala because when when they're having the protests because of the elections everything goes up. The, the produce and everything was horrible because you couldn't get anything in here it was yeah it was yes we it caused we, caused some I mean that's the only reason I knew that was going on because <laughs> people were complaining about that so. the highlands of Guatemala are the bread basket of the region and yeah. so we, we produce a lot of food uh, and, but, but I don't know what the makeup is of exactly of the trade. I do know that the borders are useless and terrible and they just drive up costs. And you know, we were just talking yeah. about this before the show, like the lines and lines of trucks just getting their stamp. Well, that's the other reason the vegetables are, are second rate, I think, in huh. El Salvador is because they sit at the border for a day in the heat trying to get through. At before, least a yeah. day. It's yeah. terrible. I mean, it is. The, the fact that we have a border that has that kind of a line when you go between France and Germany, who've got more words between them than we have, you know, languages, yeah. uh, and we like you can cross without any problem, and, and we have this nonsense going on that, of course, keeps a bunch of fat people fat that don't do any work because they're cantillioners and fiat is a nightmare. But um, in terms of the Bukele influence in Bitcoin, it's not really a thing, but it will become one very quickly. And with uh, Immutable Democracy, the, the documentary that uh, I highly suggest everyone go and watch, uh, check out film.simpleproof.com. If you can bring that up, that'd be great. Uh, 
there's been an interesting uh, shift in that everyone knows what's happening with the elections because the authorities have decided since the current authorities lost terribly because they're mediocre and awful and they cheated everyone out of the elections but they can't take away they, they basically there was a number of candidates that seven they, candidates they basically that basically said couldn't run I think for one reason or another six candidates that were officially canceled like disallowed to run and i think another three candidates that were basically exiled threatened with jail so you had like nine people that would have probably won the election that just weren't allowed to run the last one was the most egregious the last poll consulting Guatemalans as to who they're going to vote for had a guy 25 percent like more than double above everyone else and 30 days before the election disrespecting all legal norms that we have because the last time you could have done this was four months before they chopped them off and so obviously people lost their guy they were they're not going to vote for the official candidate yeah because they know where the bullet came from, right? And so they went with someone else that was a surprise. And so the system is arguing, well, he Wait, was this person literally killed? No. So okay. That, no. No. He's. I, I was. I was trying to remember sorry. that yes. the the news. I think. I think that happened in Ecuador. There was. No. Yeah. The a candidate yeah. in Ecuador okay. was murdered. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have used that. But it's his political campaign yeah. was was killed, uh, in in most egregious manner. And, uh, you know, people were just fat satisfied and went somewhere else, but the system lost. And so the, 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 the status quo is arguing, well, the polls didn't show him winning. And so it must be election fraud. And like the last poll had another guy winning yeah. that you didn't even let compete. So it's like how, like how there's these people that live in a fantasy world. And that's why I tried to reach them with this to say, look, it's one thing to go on Twitter or wherever or on WhatsApp and spread a bunch of lies. How about we, instead of talking about it with our opinions, actually sit down with the documents and just do the work, right? It's much more useful to use that pent up energy and all that anger you have at them stealing the election to come in and actually just do the work. And we did the work. We published our report. It's an 82 page report that goes into every single election, this showing the discrepancies and everything. And it's like the presidential election has discrepancies, but they do not amount to the 200,000 votes that elected the winner. And um, so the, the status quo is trying to fight this. And there's a lot of, you know, we could go back to civil war. It's it's that sad right now so do you Guatemala. think if they nullify that election and, and call a new election that it'll violence it, will break out it'll be a civil war the the the, the, the protests that you're referring to that interrupted the food supply to el salvador were the people revolting sending a very clear message to the status quo we've had enough it's been over 70 years since there's like of the same system like different management same ownership since 19 55 ish and you know, like we we decided to, for a change and ownership is going to change and but it's just the executive branch legislative judiciary it's the same but even then they're they're trying to 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 basically do a coup against this but the the message is clear if if they do prevent him and worse if they murder him because that's what i'm really concerned about if bernardo arevalo the the next president of guatemala is murdered or isn't allowed to take office, we will go back to civil war. And the result will be much worse, much, yeah. much worse. So my, um, but I'm, it's, it's a low probability scenario. I would put it at 5% or lower. Um, so 95% chance that nothing, you know, he just takes office January 15th. And basically you have an executive branch that is now contrary to the entire political apparatus. And I'm hopeful that, that it's made me optimistic for Guatemala the first time in, in my entire life because they cancel each other out. Yeah. There won't be anything done. But that's better than them stealing all the money in the world, which is what they've been doing this entire time. No hospitals, no roads, no schools, no security, just a bunch of criminals getting richer. Right? That's what my adult life has been in Guatemala. Now the faucet gets turned off and we get to work. Well... We'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Hopefully that's uh, everything goes smooth and they're able to make that transition peacefully. 
Uh, if not, you might have a new neighbor here in yeah. El Zonte. <laughs> Well, not that you would ever want, you know, bad things to happen, but uh, but at this this is helpful for you guys in that it shines a spotlight on why it's important to have elections validated, to have things clear. So even just to dispel distrust, because when you have distrust in a system, it breaks down. Sure. So, right. so how can people find out more? Where should they follow you? What if there's practical things they can do? to implement these type of things in their own countries? What's sure. that people know? So uh, first I recommend finding immutable democracy at film.simpleproof.com or just Google. Can they find it on YouTube? YouTube, too? yeah, okay. Google, YouTube, immutable democracy. It's in English and in Spanish, share it with your friends. Um, two, we will be putting uh, more content out there about um, the auditing bit. Right now you can go to fiscaldigital.net but it's all in Spanish, so it might not be that helpful. But yeah, my message is find the post-election auditors in your country and orange pill them. And if you care about elections, start finding out. If you wanted to do an audit of your election and verify for yourself who won, how do you do that? And just go and ask stupid questions. You know, just like, what does it take? Uh, I use a lot of Freedom of Information Act requests in, or the equivalent in my country to just ask for all the data. It's like, I just want the receipts. Just show me the receipts. And they're like, it's a lot of data. I don't care. <laughs> just, I just want to see them. Can I, can I just see it? And, and you might be surprised by what you find, right? And uh, certainly I was surprised that it, it is a long you know, story in the making, but it led to the authorities finally incorporating Bitcoin. And, and you know, if we can bring trust back to elections, then, you know, the the fiat apocalypse might not be so bad, you know, it's inevitable, but, you know, the the chaos that can ensue from uh, people distrusting elections entirely is so dangerous that I do think it's a responsibility that Bitcoiners have, but it's an opportunity, yeah. right? It's all, there's so many people without hope, and so maybe if this, if you haven't found your place in Bitcoin, then, you know, and the elections are, are exciting, just mutable democracy. And I came for Bitcoin. Uh, I came for democracy, but I stayed for Bitcoin. And shout out to Stackworks, Stackworks. For, for what they're doing as far as giving employment to people around the world that they get paid in Bitcoin. So excited to see as they progress and perfect the the system and the way that works yeah a lot stack, of potential there stackwork.com uh they do business process automation through ai and lightning network and yeah so it's it's an incredibly powerful uh, company and, and tool to you know mobilize and organize work for from thousands of people so uh shout out to them and uh appreciate you mike and just i wanted to say I, i've been coming here for a few years i met you in 2020 i was i don't know if you remember i was with you when uh the announcement happened. i do i remember in miami and uh so i'll never forget that just yeah. the honor of having uh been able to hear that officially uh, uh with you is, is that was surreal that was just like yeah. well, it, it 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 really for me it's okay game on you yeah know? it's like uh you know shit just got real what about Twitter? Are you on Twitter? I'm on Twitter as Carlos Toriello. Okay. Uh, Carlinho. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a mouthful. So, so make sure you follow Carlinho on Twitter so you sure. uh, can hear updates on all this that's happening. Well, I'm not too active, but uh, hopefully you'll find out about it. I mean, we're, it's uh, elections and Bitcoin get you knocked off of Twitter. So yeah. I'm, there's many efforts that have gotten knocked off. Uh, so it's, I'm still there for a little while. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> soon on Oster, uh, but uh, yes. All right. Thank well, you so much. We'll, we'll have to uh, have a, a follow up here this uh, next year with all these new elections and see what kind of progress you guys. Well, and, and part of the message is uh, I do believe that with all this, uh, Nayib Bukele's presidential election could be the most transparent election in the history of the world. Yeah. Um, There's huge, huge opportunity there. And Bitcoin can make it happen. So. Uh, if you think that Nayib Bukele should be the most transparently elected president of all time, then definitely reach out. Well, I've, I've heard that he occasionally has listened to this podcast, so maybe he'll listen to this one and uh, reach out to you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Take care. A la orden. All right.